Have you ever wished that your Terminator X could run dual widebands without having to spend thousands upgrading to a Dominator? You can actually add a second wideband for under $200. In this video, I'll show you exactly how to set it up, who should and shouldn't do it, and what trade-offs you'll face compared to a Dominator. So the first step in making this work is we need to actually choose and buy a wideband controller. I'm gonna give you two examples. One's probably the most common, most popular wideband of all time. Super inexpensive, maybe not the greatest thing in the world. Uh, and then another option that is roughly twice as expensive, but like 10,000 times better in my opinion. So uh, it's up to you which one you wanna choose. Obviously you can use any other one as well, but these are the two I'm gonna show you in this video. So the first option here is this AM304110. You can see here it's under 200 bucks. I would encourage, this is on Summit's website, I would encourage you to buy this from a real reputable website, like not Amazon, not eBay, because there are a lot of fakes and obviously you don't want to buy a fake wideband. And worth noting, this does use the same Bosch 4.9 sensor that your Terminator X does use. Uh, so if you had this and your Holly sensor quit working, you could theoretically just swap it out with this one. The next option is from Ballinger Motorsports. They have several different models. Some are, I don't think, available anymore in some newer models. So you have to dig around and figure out exactly which model works works best for you, uh, but I've had great luck with these. And you can actually get these with uh, Bosch sensors or NTK sensors. Uh, the NTK sensors, in my opinion, are worth the extra money. Probably don't need to go lab grade on this. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to have a wideband controller that's you know, more expensive than the ECU or I wouldn't get too carried away price wise on this. Okay, so now we're in the Terminator X software. Uh, the first thing we need to do, go to toolbox, add individual configuration, go to IO default. And now we have this IO option up here. So we'll click on that. And we're going to be adding a input because we are sending information from our device to the ECU and you have to give it a name. I would probably name this like whichever side of the engine it's on. I mean, you can name it whatever you want, but so we'll just call it like left O2. I'm gonna click enable. And then we need to choose our type, which in this case, uh, the wide bands are gonna have a five volt output. Uh, so our input type is gonna be five volt. And then we go to configure. So starting at the top, go all the way down. We're gonna go to custom five volt. Then our unit type, uh, we're just gonna use AFR. If you wanted to use Lambda, you could do that or whatever. You can name it whatever you want, or you can choose from the drop down menu. But I think for a majority of people using Holly AFR is most likely what you're going to use. And then for format, uh, you can either do 1.2 or 1.23. Ultimately, this is just going to change the amount of numbers that it's going to show you past uh, the decimal point. Now for sensor minimum and maximum and our actual voltage scaling here, we're going to have to go to the owner's manual for whichever wideband controller that you choose. So for this, I'm actually gonna start off showing you the Ballinger as it's a little bit easier, and then we'll look at the AEM. So again, here's the Ballinger directions. And again, this will this process will be the same for whichever wideband you choose. You just need to make sure that it has a zero to five volt output, uh, which I don't recall ever seeing an actual wideband that didn't have that. So coming, scrolling down here, here is our analog output. So zero volts is nine to one air fuel, five volts is 16 to one air fuel. So we'll go back into the software. So our voltage scaling is down here at the bottom. So zero and five volts, so just type five, highlight the whole thing. And then you can either hit R to fill row values or right click fill row values. I prefer using the hotkeys, but it's a little easier to display like this. And then we had zero volts was nine to one air fuel. So we'll type nine there. And then we will type 16 to one here. Same thing, we'll left click and drag. I'm just gonna hit R and that gives us a linear voltage scale. And you see here, it looks a little bit weird because it's a flat line. So we do need to go back up here and we need to change our sensor minimum and maximum. So again, nine for the minimum, 16 for the maximum. And if you wanted to set any warnings, uh, you could do that here by changing these values. And let's see, if we just type like 12, you can see we get the warning values here. For this example, we're just gonna keep them all the same. So as far as the setup goes, that's all that there is to it really. And we do need to pin map it. And I'm gonna show you the AEM version on this because it's a little bit different. Again, depending on which wideband you use, when they're linear like that, it's super simple. Uh, sometimes they're not, so you need to input the data manually. So let's look at AEM real quick. Since this, due to the price, again, like I said before, is like the most common wideband on earth. So there's probably a pretty good chance that some of you guys will go this direction. So, 
here's our AM instructions. We'll scroll down. And then as far as the wiring goes, again, check the manual for your wideband. You can see this AM is super easy. You just have 12 volt switch power uh, chassis ground. And then this one here is our white zero to five volt output. That's the wire that we're going to connect to the ECU. Uh, some of these widebands will have 12 volt power and chassis ground, but then they will also have a sensor ground as well. So just make sure that you get that correct for the unit that you're using. And in this case, we're not using the serial output. So you can just ignore that. So. You're going to go down until we find our voltage scale. And here is our scale here. So uh, you can see how this is a little bit more intimidating uh, than just the linear zero to five volt like the Ballinger had. So worth noting, uh, same thing. We have our O2 voltage on the left here. Here's our gasoline scale numbers right here. Uh, but you could also, if you didn't want to view in gasoline AFR, you could choose Lambda and obviously any of these other options. I would say the gasoline, probably what 98% of you would use. And there's probably a couple percent that might prefer to view things in Lambda. Uh, one thing that I have done in the past is have one wideband that displays in air fuel ratio and then another one that displays in Lambda. So that way you can view both both at the same time uh, can kind of familiarize yourself with Lambda. Uh, there's a lot of other advantages of using Lambda, but Holly, generally speaking, runs in AFR. They recently added the ability to monitor a Lambda, but it's basically converting the gasoline scale back to Lambda. Uh, so a little bit of a weird way that they went about it. So anyways, as you can see, we have way more numbers here than we have uh, in our Holly software. So I think we only have like 16, if I remember right, breakpoints for the Holly. So you kind of have two options here. So you can see we have zero volts is 10 to one. And this is where AM likes to do AEM things. Instead of being a five volts, it's 4.99. And instead of being 20 to one air fuel ratio, it's 19.98. So technically you could do zero volts is 10 to one, five volts, is 20 to one, and you're gonna be closer than the accuracy of the wideband, in my opinion. Uh, but if you wanted to do it the correct way, uh, you would actually need to split this up to where it works with the amount of breakpoints that we have with Holly. So to do that, I just made this spreadsheet real quick, so it's a lot easier to just copy and paste. So after you copy it, you can just come down here, paste it in. Now you can see we got 4.99, the weird number. And then we do the same thing for the actual calibration. Uh, if you have tuned the trilogy, I'll drop this into your account over there. Uh, if you want a copy of this spreadsheet, uh, if you join my email list, I can send it to you that way. So same thing, copy our gasoline scale, come back into our software, paste that in. And now you can see that it broke, like this doesn't work right. So why is that? It's because we did not change our sensor maximum here. So we need to do 10. Make sure they all change. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. We'll do 20 here. Oops. Okay, now that that's done that, usually if it breaks like that, I'll just go ahead and repaste it in just to make sure that everything kind of stayed on track. In this case, it did. And, and you can see that this isn't perfectly, it's almost linear, but it's not perfectly linear. Now, the next thing that you can do, which I'm not going to sit here and bore you to death with it, but if you pull up the directions again, uh, you can just go through and make sure that all of your breakpoints actually match. So here, we'll just do 1.4 volts, and we want to make sure it's 1280. So 1.4 volts, 1280. So if you want to just make sure, you can double check all of these. Now that's all we need to do for the calibration. Uh, the last thing that we need to do is we need to go to the pin map and you can see here is our five volt input and what we named it was left O2. So now we just need to drop it onto whichever one of these pins that we actually connect uh, the output wire from the wideband to. So let's just say A12 here or input number one here is already taken. Uh, so we'll just go here to A3 and all of these are five volt inputs, but just make sure that this is five volt or that you have a five here that's available that matches this. You can drop it in like that. Click done. At this point, I would save the file probably as a different file name than what you're currently using. And then you're gonna need to upload this to the ECU and then you're probably gonna need to cycle the key. So if you like these how-to videos, I have literally a couple hundred more uh, that you can check out in the link in the description. So it turns out a lot of people get frustrated when they realize that the Terminator X only comes with one wideband. Traditionally, a V8 engine will have two O2 sensors, one for each bank. So if that's the case, then why did Holly only include one? Only Holly knows the answer for sure, but I feel comfortable saying it was to keep the cost down and the fact that a majority of people will be perfectly fine with just one. If you're not familiar, the O2 sensor typically goes into the header after the collector or into a downpipe after a turbo, and then it monitors an average of all of the cylinders going past it. 
Uh, single turbo V8s are easy as they have all eight cylinders going into the turbo with a single downpipe, but twin turbo V8s or V8s with four to one headers end up only monitoring four of the eight cylinders, which can potentially be problematic. In theory, all eight cylinders should be running the same, but in the case of a injector failure, for example, if it happens on the bank with no O2 sensor, you wouldn't really have a way to know about it. So the primary benefits of having dual O2 sensors would be being able to monitor both banks of the engine to keep an eye on things and make sure that they stay safe. And it's no secret that Terminator X's can have O2 sensors go bad. With a second sensor, it's far easier to identify if you have a bad sensor or your sensor is just reading full lean or whatever the case may be. And it also becomes much easier to troubleshoot poor running conditions like I said, if you have an injector that gets stuck, it's easy to identify it as if you have a way to monitor uh, the air-fuel ratio on both cylinders. Now, the downside to having two O2 sensors is that it's obviously more expensive. On a Terminator X, it is going to use up one of your four inputs, and it can sometimes become more confusing if the two widebands are reading differently, uh, then you don't know which one is correct or which one you should be trusting. So based off of all of those pros and cons, you should be able to decide if adding a second wideband is for you or not. And in my opinion, the majority of people are going to be just fine with one wideband unless they're troubleshooting, uh, they just want extra peace of mind, or maybe it's something that they're leaning on really hard and trying to make a bunch of power. Either way, having two is way nicer for sure. Also, it's worth noting, if you're not the type of person who is actively data logging your car and looking at and reviewing the logs, then this probably isn't something that's going to be beneficial for you to do, as the biggest disadvantage of doing this with the Terminator X versus doing it with the Dominator is that unlike the Dominator, the Terminator X will only have the ability to monitor and log the secondary wideband, it's not going to be used to make any fueling changes. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Now, how does this differ from a Dominator ECU? Let's take a look. So we go into our system ICF, engine parameters. You can see here for our wideband O2, one, we only have one type and two, we only we don't have the option to add any a second one or anything like that. But if we go into the Dominator software, same thing, system ICF, engine parameters, and here we have wideband O2. So you have Bosch and NTK, uh, but if we change from one sensor to two sensors, obviously uh, that gives us the option to have two, uh, but kind of more importantly is we can average between them. We can use only the left, only the right, only the leanest or only the richest. And whatever you choose here is what is going to control the closed loop control. So essentially what that means is we have the ability to run two sensors, uh, but then we also have the ability to decide which of those two sensors is going to control the feedback for the closed loop and the learn. And with the Terminator X, the second wideband that we just added is only for monitoring purposes. We cannot use that to actually get any closed loop or learn feedback. Okay, if we go back to the Terminator X software, if we click on this E over here, we can edit our views. And if we scroll over to the right, you'll see that we have this left O2. Uh, so then you can just drag this into whichever display that you want to view it on. We'll just click on sensors for the time being. Just click save. And now we go to sensors and we're able to view our wideband O2. Obviously nothing's powered on, so it's not working at this moment. And the same thing will apply to a data log. So now that we've input everything, set everything up, pin mapped it, I've wired it to the ECU. And as we swing the voltage, you can see that the air fuel ratio is changing. And this is configured uh, nine to 16 as far as the air fuel ratio goes, so that's pretty cool. And one last thing while we're at it, we'll just log it real quick, stop the log. Now the data log saved, same thing if we click on this E, go into our channels list, scroll over to the right until you find it, if it left O2 is what we named it. So we'll just drop this in, click OK, click save, and now we have left O2, so you would probably wanna scale this something more along the lines of the range of the sensor, and there you go. And this green line here is TPS, and I have, I have the 5 volt input for the wideband actually wired to uh, the TPS input on my simulator. So that's why those are following themselves there. But uh, yeah, as you scroll through, now you can see if you don't do what I just did, that you'll have your secondary O2. So if you've not seen the new Terminator X Bluetooth module, I would suggest that you watch this video on the screen here. It's pretty cool.